James Harden traded from the Sixers to the Clippers. What does that mean for the Pacers? Surprisingly, more than you think. Plus, Pacers second-round pick signs in the G League. Two good and two concerning stats about the Pacers so far. And a Celtics preview and injury updates. We're talking about all of that. Holy cow, on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Wednesday, everybody, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today, first of all, it's Halloween for me talking, not for you listening. So if you're watching on YouTube, yes, I'm wearing a Viking hat. I had a lot of fun wearing this when trick-or-treaters came to my house today, and I figured, in the spirit of it, let's keep it on. Two, holy cow, do we have a lot to talk about from Pacer land today. James Harden got traded, and yes, it impacts the Pacers directly. This isn't just some little, oh, it's either in the same conference and timeline stuff. There's a direct hit, and we'll talk about it. And another roster note for the Pacers surrounding their second round pick, Mojave King, plus two good stats and two concerning ones for the Pacers so far this season, and a Celtics preview filled with some injury updates. Yikes, this early in the season for the Pacers. We'll start with the big news that rocked the NBA. James Harden traded from Philly to LA. We all saw it coming for forever. It just took absolutely forever for it to get there. Everybody played every freaking card they could along the way. If you listen to Lockdown NBA Monday night going into Tuesday, we published it about two hours before the James Harden trade. David Ramil and I actually discussed why we thought there would be a resolution to the James Harden stuff this week or like some serious progress. And then a trade happened two hours later. So feeling good about the prediction, even though what I thought would happen was not actually what ended up happening. I did expect something significant to actually happen. And here we are. James Harden, P.J. Tucker, Philip Petrusev to the Clippers. Don't need to rehash the whole trade, but like Marcus Morris and Nick Batum and K.J. Martin and Robert Covington are on the Sixers now. And a pick swap went to the Thunder and another first went to the Sixers. And I just rehashed the whole trade, even though I said I wouldn't. Uh, I think everybody did pretty well. <laughs> not going to lie. I think the Sixers did way better than they're getting given credit for, though. They got a lot of good stuff to make their team reshaped in the future. Clippers had to do it. Thunder are the team I actually don't get it for the most. Trading up a guaranteed pick for a swap is fascinating, but it's a safe-looking gamble. Doesn't matter what I think about those stuff. This is a Pacers podcast. What does this mean for the Pacers? Why did I make a big deal about what this means for the Pacers? Well, the first one is the, the most direct, bam, the Pacers care about this hit, and that is, the Pacers have two first-round draft picks in 2024. Their own pick, which wherever they fall, that's where that will be. And they have a second pick they got in a trade with the Nuggets last year. And that pick came from OKC in a three-team trade. And it is the worst of the four following draft picks. The Houston Rockets first-round pick, the Utah Jazz first-round pick, the OKC Thunder first-round pick, and the Clippers. That's where the Pacers come in here. The Clippers are the fourth one there. So whichever one of those teams finishes with the best record, and their board has the worst first-round pick. So let's say the Clippers are the best team in the NBA, and they pick 30. That pick goes to the Pacers, right? So at the time that trade is made, right, who knows what the Clippers will be. And the Thunders are, like, young and good, but ascending. And the Jazz and the Rockets aren't very good. There's some protections on those two. But the Pacers get the worst one of the ones available to them. So there's a chance that pick ends up decent to good, right? If the Clippers stumble or they deal with injuries and the Thunder don't ascend, who knows? That, that doesn't matter what the thought was at the time of the trade. What matters is now the Clippers have James Harden. So their fortunes will change. And even if he doesn't make them that much better, doesn't raise their ceiling that much, for a team that is not that healthy, James Harden plays a good amount, right? And he's good, right? He's one of the best passers in the world still, even though he doesn't have the same burst anymore. So they're going to be better, right? The Clippers are going to be better this season. And they are now, I already thought they were the most likely team to send the Pacers the pick, from that transaction. Now I think they're even more the most likely team to send the Pacers to pick from that transaction. So on the Pacers side, they will hope that that flames out dramatically and very, very soon <laughs> that the Clippers just can't figure it out. And it does not go well for them with James Harden on their team and injuries pile up for them and all sorts of stuff. Now it could work great and that would not be great for the Pacers, but there is obviously disaster potential with that squad. Clippers beat the Magic last night. I think they're now, yeah, they're now three and one and very, very close to four and zero. They are playing pretty well. So 
Uh, now they could be better. James Harden is now on the Clippers. That directly impacts the Pacers and their draft pick, draft picks, I should say, um, for the next draft. That's the most direct hit. Definitely matters for the Pacers. They'll be tracking that indirectly a little bit more. I mean, look, the Sixers are in their conference, <laughs> which is haha. Um, their timeline's different now. That impacts the Pacers, I guess. They're also in the Pacers group for the in-season tournament, and they're worse now. That matters to the Pacers, who have a better shot in that competition. I guess that's a little bit of direct hit. In an actual direct hit, especially for next summer, the the Sixers, there was a lot of talk around the James Harden trade about them being a cap space team in the summer of 2024. They could open up some serious space, or they could even have had a lot end with James Harden's free agency. Well, now they could have a ton. They traded away P.J. Tucker in this trade. The Sixers could have like serious, serious cap space to get a very good player and a max player next summer. And that is a competitor and a good team competitor for the Pacers in the cap space environment. That is a direct hit because that's an appealing situation. Good market, good team. They've got money. They've got creativity and stability. Oh, not stability. Stability in terms of like long-term roster building. They can build a stable team. They don't have stability in, <laughs> in terms of what's going on there right now. I didn't say the right word. It doesn't matter. The Sixers are an appealing spot. So that's just another team for the Pacers to really have to compete with in the free agency market next year. And I think that is significant here. So draft wise, this hits the Pacers. They'll hope the Clippers flame out tremendously this season. Free agency wise next year, this could impact the Pacers unless the Sixers make a move this season with all their new stuff. They've got more picks. They've got expiring contracts. They're certainly in a situation to make such a trade and we'll see where it shakes out for them or if they're willing to swap expiring contracts later in the season. Who knows? There's a lot that could happen there, but that trade, while it does not involve the Pacers directly, is sort of relevant to them in many ways. The other transactional note that I want to cover here on Lockdown Pacers, I didn't think there'd be a good time to do this, but thank you, James Harden Trade, for giving me a time to squeeze something in for two and a half minutes. Mojave King, if you don't remember him, uh, Pacers drafted him 47th overall back in the most recent draft. They got that pick also in the I-4. Uh, they got that pick from the Lakers, but it was like in a trade back back from their original picks, that Nuggets trade coming up twice in this podcast. But anyway, they picked him at 47, uh, and then it was revealed not long after from reporting that he would be a draft and stash. He would not be playing for the Pacers this season. Uh, it wasn't clear where. He said he wanted to go the place that would be the best for his development. Um, well, that place turns out to be the Indiana Madans, which is great for the Pacers. <laughs> the guy they picked, they don't even have to give him an NBA contract or a two-way deal, and he's still in their organization and still in the G League developing under their watchful eye. The Mad Ants this year are playing in Gamebridge and practicing in the St. Vincent Center, right? So they'll get to watch Mojave King up close. They keep his draft rights, and he's still in the organization. That's a win for the Pacers. It may be a bummer. For, I don't know what Mojave King was wanting or what his financial options were. It may be a bummer for him there. I don't know. I haven't talked to him, but that is where his situation will be. This has happened before with some success for guys and some not-so-successful uh, situations. Abdel Nader, a success uh, with the Celtics, Isaiah Hartenstein did this when the Rockets drafted him. He went to the G League for a year and then got the call up the following year, right? This isn't unheard of. So if the Pacers brought him in for camp and then waived him and then wanted to send him to the G League, well, they would have lost his draft rights because they'd have signed him to an NBA contract and then released him from an NBA contract. This path means the Pacers still have his draft rights. So Mojave King cannot sign with any other NBA team but the Pacers. Next summer, if he's still in the Pacers' sphere, um, they would have to submit him what's called the required tender. It's a one-year non-minimum contract. Uh, one-year non-guaranteed, I forgot a word there, minimum contract. Um, if he signs it, they could just waive him, but then they lose his draft rights that way anyway. So it's a, you can't just hold a guy hostage, right? So we'll learn more about the Pacers' future with him next year. The roster crunch certainly uh, impacted their draft this past year, but that's where their 47th overall pick is in the organization for the Pacers. Best case scenario, right? To have him in your building, to be able to see him all the time is the best possible way to develop him and get a view of him up close. You invested draft capital in him. So that's a win for the Pacers. That's Mojave King's situation. So you will still be hearing his name this year, despite it seeming like for a bit there that he would be going elsewhere and maybe being part of the NBA sphere at a later date. That is now going to happen at a much sooner date. That is your transactional updates to start November. Somehow the transaction cycle in the NBA never stops. Let's talk about not that. Let's talk about basketball and the basketball games played by the Pacers and do a way too early stat analysis of the Pacers. Two good stats, two concerning ones 
for the Pacers so far at this stage of the season. We'll talk about that coming right up after I talk to you guys about the awesome, awesome people over at FanDuel. You can score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. It's the perfect time to be a FanDuel user. NBA, it's rolling. It's the first full calendar month of the league is about to start. The NFL is rolling. It's the middle of the season. The MLB is in the World Series. Right now, new customers on FanDuel get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That simple. That's $150. That's a lot. If your team wins, make that money line bet. If you win, boom, $150 in bonus bets. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time than right now with an offer like that to get in on the action. Their app is super easy to use, and they have a wide range of fun betting options, including over-unders, player props, spreads, and more. Your faves are all there. So visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and kick off the NFL season with $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. FanDuel.com slash lockdown. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day. In the spirit of the lead topic today, make your second listen. Locked on Clippers or Locked on 76ers. For the big meat and potatoes, James Harden on the move, other stuff going the other way. Or Locked on Thunder to hear Rylan Styles talk about the Thunder always sneaking into stuff. Somehow the Thunder are always there. They're waiting. They're lurking. They want their picks. They want their assets. They're doing something. And they did it again. Sam Presti is an active dude. He likes to hop in on these trades. Let's talk about the basketball games the Pacers have played this season, three of them so far. And I want to talk about some stats that I haven't talked about yet, or if I have, mostly in passing. We'll do two concerning and two good, good cop, bad cop style here. Uh, so I don't ramble too much on one thing or not talk enough about one thing that felt like the right number uh, of stats to dive into. Let's start with one that I think the Pacers will say is great. And that's their three-point defense. This is something that they've wanted to improve this year. Prevent teams from shooting threes. That's part of their defensive adjustment for this season. They don't want to run teams off the line. They want to suck guys into the paint. Well, so far, opposing teams are taking 24 three-pointers per game against the Pacers. That is the lowest number of any team in the NBA first by the Pacers. They are succeeding. They are running their guys off the line. That's exactly what you want to see. Uh, if you're the Pacers, that's something they've been working on. Tyrese Halberton joked that it's hard for them to practice because they're playing against that scheme, and it's hard for them to get off the threes. And so when the Pacers are out there in games, they're like, hey, look, there's these attempts, right? So that is fantastic for them. Their, their opponents are making nine threes per game, nine out of 24. The ones they are conceding have been a little more open. It's just kind of a result of how they're doing that. So their opponents are shooting pretty well from deep, 37.5%, but giving up under 10 makes a game, six, actually seven fewer than they're scoring themselves, and, and only allowing 24 attempts. That's a success. That's a win for their schematic change, despite their many defensive errors. And, I mean, honestly, if you want to look at their shot profile as another concerning part of this, because they're giving up the fewest threes, well, guess what? They're giving up the most twos, 72-point attempts allowed per game, but they're actually defending them pretty well, at least so far. The results have been good. 47.6% of opponent twos have gone in. That's fourth best in the league, right? So they're actually kind of defending from a shot profile perspective. The shots that they want, even though they're giving up not a lot of twos, uh, or not a lot of threes, excuse me, and a lot of twos, they've done a good enough job actually giving up the shots they want. That's a scheme success so far for the Pacers. We'll get to concerning stat now. This is a defensive one. Pacers are not getting steals. They're not forcing turnovers from their opponent. Their opponents so far this season are averaging 11.3 turnovers per game. That's the second best number in the league, meaning they're taking care of the ball, getting lots of chances against the Pacers. And that is partially a result of what they're doing defensively as well. It's less aggressive, at least it seems like it so far. They're not forcing as many errors. And for a team that likes to run and likes to be in the open floor, steals are good. Steals are a good way to get into those moments quickly or you're already on the pressure. You're not dealing with the team running back for defense. They're a great play. Pacers 25th in steals per game and 29th in turnovers allowed. That has been a problem for them so far, right? They haven't been able to execute that part of their identity. And if you know, if you just look at opponent four or four factors in general, a lot of the Pacers four factors are pretty good. They're all their offensive ones are solid on defense. Their biggest concern one for sure is that turnover rate one, their opponent's turnover rate less than 10%. That's the second worst number in the league. They've got to be a little bit better 
and applying a little more pressure there, forcing some turnovers, making their opponents uncomfortable. Some of that is individual defensive lapses. Some of that's rotation lapses. Either way, they've got to be better at that and many other things on the defensive end. Lots of other good stats you could go to. For example, on the flip side of the one I actually just said is the Pacers aren't turning it over very much. They're fifth best in the league, only giving up uh, the ball with 12.3 times per game. Fifth best. That's fantastic. They're rebounding. They actually lead the league in defensive rebounds per game right now. Partially that is due to their pace of play. Uh, but I think the number that they'll be the happiest with is their just general shooting. 37% from three. 56% from two. Both of those numbers are in the top 10, of course, for a good offense. That's going to look great. But you pair that with their top of the league assist per game number and their low turnover rate. And all of a sudden, you've got a great offense, right? Going back to those four factors sort of things. Pacers currently fourth in offensive rating because their effective field goal percentage is the ninth best in the league. And that doesn't even account for a field free throw percentage, which the Pacers are first in the league right now. Uh, this could be updated by tomorrow, but as I read this, that's the case. And the Pacers not turning it over at all. So they're getting, they're making efficient looks and they're getting a lot of them because they're not giving the ball up very much. Their biggest fault was their game was too slow and they couldn't get enough of those attempts against the Bulls. And they got killed a little bit on the offensive glass in that one. They still are conceding a few too many offensive rebounds per game. In fact, that could be my second concerning one. So I won't go too deep there. And the Pacers offensive rebound rate's been fine. Their free throw rate is below average, but not the worst thing in the world. All their offensive four factors truly look fantastic. And of course, if you've watched them, that makes sense. They scored 143. They scored 125. They won both those games. They had three-ish good offensive quarters against the Bulls and then one kind of stinky one. If they had scored 30 in that final quarter, they'd have been well over 110 in all their games. Their offense would have been humming. They didn't obviously. And that is a let one of their 12 quarters this season. That is still a big percentage, but in general, their offensive stats look good and big picture, the shots they're taking and making have been a success for them, but they'll be very much tested against an awesome, awesome Celtics defense tonight. My second and final concerning stat, I guess I'll just do the one I just said a second ago. There's so many I could go through. They're giving up a lot of offensive rebounds, right? And that was a problem for them uh, in the past currently 13 allowed offensive rebounds per game. Uh, that's a 7.4% increase from last year where the Pacers were not giving up that many offensive rebounds. And they're getting a lot of defensive rebounds, but they're just allowing a lot of shots. Their pace of play means there's a lot of shots going up for both teams. So yes, there's a little bit of a misleading numbers there, but the percentage has also gone up, which matters here. Pacers have got to be better on the glass. They've got to win the possession game. That's something I talk about a lot is that possession game. Right now, they're not doing that. Uh, they're attempting four more shots per game than their opponent, right? They're taking 97.7 per game through three games. They've given up 94. That's good. Four extra shots is good. But the flip side of that is the free throws, where they're taking 18 per game. That's the fourth fewest. And they're giving up 28 per game, which is the second highest. So that means, true shot attempt-wise, the their opponents are getting more looks and, in general, efficient ones from the foul line. So the possession battle has not been awesome for them, especially because, like I said, they're not getting that many steals. So they're losing, especially with those offensive rebounds, chances. They're giving the other team more chances than them. And they have been so efficient that it hasn't mattered. And that could be a trend for them is they don't care about the possessions part as much. They care about being as efficient as possible. And that's great. That's worked for a lot of teams for a lot of time. But the possession game does matter. The Grizzlies, for years were the team leaning into that the most, and it helped them quite a bit. Other teams are now really pushing that way, and I think that is smart. But the Pacers uh, need to, I think, lean a little more towards the possession battle, trying to get more possessions, whether that's from steals, whether that's preventing offensive rebounds for their team. Just any way to swing that pendulum back towards them a little bit, I think would go a long way. It's really fun to dive into the four factors early in the season and some other key advanced stats. You can check these all out on Basketball Reference, but those are some ones I wanted to highlight, and we'll see how they play out against a very tough opponent tonight. Perhaps one of the toughest games they'll play all season on the road in Boston against the new look undefeated Boston Celtics. We'll talk about what the Pacers can do to potentially win that game, and some very important injury updates we found out on Tuesday to close out today's show. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. The flip side of this segment, go listen to Lockdown Celtics. John Corrales kills it over there covering that team. And they are the final officially undefeated team 
in the Eastern Conference. The Magic have lost. The Pacers have lost. It is just the Celtics at 3-0. Two West undefeated teams. Denver and Boston, two of the final three undefeated teams, as we all predicted. And the third one is the Dallas Mavericks. Credit to the Mavs. They're actually having a solid start to the season. I did not predict they would do very well this year, so credit to them. I'm wrong. Luka looks great. Uh, let's talk Pacers, Celtics. And before we do that, important context needed for this game. Practice on Tuesday. We're there. We're doing our uh, media session with Rick Carlisle. And Ben Matherin uh, was in not basketball clothing. And I couldn't see Tyrese Halliburton. So, you know, when you do, when you walk in and you, you see who you see and you do your count of all the players, right? That's one of the first things uh, I do there. You figure out who it is that isn't there. Or maybe they're in the white room. Maybe you can't see them. But anyway, in doing all that in practice, I was like, okay, there's not enough guys. So I asked Rick Carlisle for a health update. Two huge ones, two very significant ones for the Pacers we learned in that moment. One, Tyrese Halliburton has an ankle injury. Uh, apparently in the Bulls game, I don't know when this happened because it didn't look like he was ever truly hobbling. Apparently he landed on Jalen Smith's foot during that game and hurt his ankle. He did not practice Tuesday. Uh, he is questionable for Pacers Celtics. Uh, and then Ben Matherin was the other one. Ben Matherin has an elbow injury. He was meeting with doctors on Tuesday. He finished 4 of 11 shooting from the field against the Bulls, and that's the game he suffered, said injury, apparently in the first half. That's what Rick Carlisle said. Credit to Matherin. He made his foul shots. He was still aggressive attacking the basket, but an elbow injury is a big deal, and it's his right elbow. It is his shooting elbow. Rick told us that. We don't know. I didn't ask. I, bad journalism from me, but didn't follow up on which ankle it is for Halberton, but we did get that uh, from Matherin. So two significant injuries, right? If either of those guys can't play, Rick's exact quote was, those guys will likely be listed as questionable at best. We'll see where they are tomorrow. So neither of them um, practiced Tuesday. We'll see what that means for their outlook against the Celtics. Without them, I mean, without one of them, TJ McConnell just slides in. Nemhard goes off the ball a little bit maybe, or even McConnell just slides into the second ball handler next to Halberton sometimes. Right, that That is easy if you miss one guard. If you miss both of them, then it gets a little more complicated, right? The, the the easiest, least disruptive way to do it is Ben Shepard is just in and McConnell's in. Um, but there's also like you move Neesmith down a spot and play Jarris Walker as an option or Jordan Wara maybe even to light up some scoring, right? So there's a lot of ways this could go if neither of them can play. And I started to think about these things and how I would like to talk about them and jotting stuff down in my notes. And then the Pacers put out their injury report. And Jalen Smith is also questionable. How about a third one? Um, Jalen Smith according to the released Pacers injury report, just before 5 o'clock uh, is questionable with a left knee sprain. That one I kind of remembered, actually, from if you remember the game, Jalen Smith and Iowa Jasunmu had like a nice knee collision. Jalen Smith came out for a little bit. I don't know why I said nice knee collision. There's no such thing as a nice knee collision. They had a solid contact on a knee collision. Out came Jalen Smith. I don't think that took him out for the whole rest of the game, but either way, knee collision sucked. They hurt. So, that, I mean, that th this could be a very different looking Pacers team in Boston. We'll see what actually happens in there. But if Smith can't go and Alburn can't go and Matherin can't go, all of a sudden three new Pacers entering the fray, likely at least at the five, it's easy to tell who it would be. But in, in terms of the rotation and the backup guards, we'll see. This is what everybody said to me when I was talking all crazy about the rotation and all of preseason and camp was, well, everybody's going to play. There's going to be a Yeah, you're right. Uh, I like to know the pecking order. I think it matters. I think it's relevant when thinking about future decisions. But yes, everybody could play. And it's important for the depth to step up in this game because now their depth advantage is gone, which is potentially gone, I should say. I don't know who is and isn't going to play. I just was segueing there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal to me, right? I talked about it Monday. The Pacers' depth is an advantage for them. They have really solid second group, good ascending young talents. A buddy healed is in there playing well, right? They've had a great bench this year um that they were okay against the bulls but that was their big advantage and uh, that's especially the case against a celtics team like this that has the best top six in the nba right to me but their depth after that is not very good so you know you start thinking about it and it's like oh this could be a chance where the, the celtics starters just kick the pacer starters but and then the pacers bench kicks but how much can that even a game well now if the pacers bench is different or lesser then that changes things right that makes that unit either less cohesive or less talented or both potentially if everybody plays this doesn't really matter but 
that could be one advantage gone for the Pacers, and they're already playing a team. We're losing. Uh, obviously, you lose Halbert, and you lose a bunch of advantages. But if you lose your depth advantage too, that's really tough against the Celtics because then it's way harder for those bench minutes where you have to kick butt to actually go very well. Um, in terms of the Celtics specifically, Brown and Tatum are always a handful, especially now that they have Drew Holiday as a third destroyer of worlds on the offensive end. The Pacers aren't without Matherin, who, look, he fouled a lot, but he defended DeRozan pretty well. I thought on Monday outside of the fouls, which that's significant. He had five of them, but he, you know, he did a good job on him in general. I thought, right. He's one of the guys you'd throw on one of those two. And so if you think about who the Pacers could start, especially if there's injuries and I don't know, Bruce Brown, definitely probably Neesmith, but then he's not with the second unit and you're giving up potential avenues for the Celtics to do well elsewhere. Um, so it's hard to figure out exactly how to contain those two plus holiday. And that doesn't even account for some of the rest of the talent on their, completely insane and stacked starting five so it'll be tough for the Pacers to line up if they're dealing with injuries if they're healthy I think would we'll, I think we'll see um Bruce Brown on Jason Tatum and Ben Matherin on Jalen Brown but th then you're still left with a Halliburton on Drew Holiday situation that's tough Drew Holiday is a beast remember he had 50 against the Pacers last season his career high by a mile he's just a tough guy to guard especially for this team and the other part of this is they have Chris Tapps Porzingis now, who was like their best player for the first three quarters of their first game when they beat the Knicks. And he's always been a tough matchup for Turner. He's one of the very few guys who has the inside-out ability to really, really stretch miles out. He's not even the best screener, and he can stretch miles out, right? When he was with the Wizards last year, Porzingis was putting up big games against the Pacers. He had that ridiculous game for the Mavs when the Mavs were without Luka in Gamebridge, and they won because Porzingis went so crazy. He's a tough matchup for Turner. Um, and that becomes even more important in a game like this or you could be without your own stars if you're the Pacers. So my X factors for this game, especially with the injuries, would be Miles Turner and Andrew Nemhard. Turner's got to keep up with Porzingis because if the Pacers lose the, the, the backcourt battle, you just almost have no chance against the Celtics, right? Their talent's crazy good. The frontcourt battle, Porzingis is awesome. Horford's still really good too. Um, but you have to find a way to win it, and so it's crucial for Turner to be impactful in that matchup and protect the rim in any sort of way. He protected the rim pretty well. Uh, against Cleveland, although he struggled with Mobley specifically, but he has not had quite the defensive impact. This th His defensive impact this season has been similar to last year's, and that is a step down from what it's been in the past for him. And then Andrew Nemhard's my second X factor, both because uh, he could end up being a starter, depending on what the injuries are, but also because his steadying hand with bench units will be will matter quite a bit in the, with their current depth situation. His defense will be important against the Celtics because they're so good, and Nemhard's just got to be better than he was in the last game, and his response to that will be important for the Pacers' fortunes in this one. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to watching the Celtics. Uh, and, of course, seeing what the Pacers do to respond tomorrow. We'll talk about that game, what happened in it. Uh, if it deserves a full show, we'll do a full show. Jack Christ from Nuba is going to join us to talk Pacers, Celtics, and other topics about the Pacers' early season. And then Friday, Chris Manning from Locked on Cavs will join us. Not too much on Pacers-Cavs because we've seen that twice already if you count preseason but we'll talk a little bit about that and a little bit about the in-season tournament because that is game one of the in-season tournament for both of those teams bright aqua blue court coming your way on friday you know we'll have it all here on the locked on pacers podcast thank you guys a ton for listening today had a lot of ground to cover with the injuries with the trades with the signings with the stats but i really enjoyed it this is what uh, i love to do tomorrow like i said talking about the game tonight till then everybody have a fan Fantastic day.